Robin and Lorraine and everyone. It's time now for our scripture. And this morning I'll be reading from John 17, 17. And you'll all recognize this. This is from Christ's prayer to his Father. So it's Jesus talking very obviously here. And he says to his Father, Sanctify, it's a request, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now we'll let uh, Frank have the pulpit. Good morning, everyone. Blessing to see you here. Okay, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Two weeks ago, I attempted to give the gospel in a nutshell. Now, obviously, it's not easy to put the gospel in a nutshell. Um, we know that a child, apparently, can receive a, some understanding of the gospel and find salvation thereby. I'm not quite sure how much the Lord depends on the child's understanding. I think children are free, they're open, and they can be drawn to Christ, and the Spirit of God works in their hearts as well. And so whether they understand a lot or a little or hardly anything at all, I'm sure that the Lord is merciful and wonderful, uh, loving of children. On the other hand, we've also saw a uh, couple of weeks ago that Ellen White says that we will be studying the gospel for throughout eternity. We'll probably be studying the love of God and the great sacrifice and the sufferings that he went through in order to save our souls. I've had you, I had you turn to Romans chapter 5. We're looking at verse 18 and 19 in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, as by the offense of one, we know that that is talking about um, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, and verse 12 says, to death as well. The next two words are even so, that is, to the, to the same degree. Whatever it is that Adam caused, Jesus Christ uncaused, or undid, and restored. That's really what it's meaning to say here. Therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. By the same degree, to the same degree, by the righteousness of one. And the true rendition of this verse says, by the one act. So we know that it's talking about the cross of Calvary. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, by the one act of dying on the cross, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And this life here, of course, is probationary life. We know that Jesus, excuse me, I'm talking about Adam. When Adam sinned, we were in him. And his guilt, of course, transferred to his whole family, all the way down to us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God because of Adam's sin. But the Lord went to the cross on our behalf and paid the penalty. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. How many? All of them. All the human race. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. How many? Well, as many as will accept the gift. As many as will not ref refuse the gift of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I hope this morning that that's a settled matter in your soul that you have accepted Jesus as your personal savior, that his sacrifice has paid the penalty, and that you find yourself justified, acquitted, as it were. And Jesus means that for the whole human race. And there's a, there's a quotation in the Spirit of Prophecy that says, all that, is po that it is possible for a man to do about his salvation is to accept the invitation, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, I think, the Spirit says, come, 
and we all say come and take the water of life freely all that God asks of us is that we come to Jesus and accept the gift of salvation that's all that we need to do it's very simple isn't it yeah very simple but we're not done and that's what I want to talk about to us now is sanctification if you'll go with me to first Thessalonians we move from justification we've all found salvation in Jesus Christ we all found pardon in Jesus Christ he's paid the penalty for everyone who has sinned in the world and he offers us the gift and you and I would you be here if you had never accepted the gift well it happens that people come to church who haven't gotten there yet but I look at I'm looking over the group that's here today and I don't think that's so praise the Lord I assume that you have gotten and accepted what Jesus has done for you but that's not all God has more for us and it's a blessing to us though I think that we all don't always look at it as a blessing but it is so we're in first Thessalonians chapter uh, 4 we're looking at verse 3 the first part of verse 3 for this is the will of God even your sanctification verse um, uh, um, that was verse 3 I'm sorry uh, verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor this is what God wants from us chapter 5 we're looking at verse 23 and 24 and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ faithful is he that calls you to this to sanctification who also will do it and who is it that will do it God has promised to do it without him we can do nothing God is in the business of saving our souls he can do it but when in the case of sanctification he wants us to cooperate with him and so he will do it and what exactly is sanctification well, it's very simple. We were created as a race, perfect, in the very image of God. And when we sinned, the image was marred. What God is trying to do is restore the image of God in every person in this world. And that means that he wants to make us overcomers because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can overcome. The victory over sin is possible and he means for us to surrender to him fully so that he can do it. Now I have some really good news for you. And that's the title of our sermon for today. Overcoming is what? Easy. Is it? Well, yes it is. And I'm going to show you how easy it is in a few minutes. Now, I think... Not everyone in the world finds it easy. As a matter of fact, I've been struggling with sin in my life since I was born. I don't know about you. I assume that I'm not the only one. And, and we are so invested in habits that are not right that uh, we think it's not easy to get over it. As a matter of fact, we have the testimony. <laughs> and we can show that it's not easy because I'm 75 years old and I'm still fighting it still fighting with myself and with sin and with Satan and with the world but friends that's really the reason the reason why it's not easy is because we don't have enough incentive to overcome now that's a weird saying because if we think of what heaven will be like and that's not enough incentive for us to put aside our sin if we think of all that Jesus suffered at the cross of Calvary and the love of God and all that he's done for us, even if we go on the other side of the picture and we think of what we will suffer as Jesus suffered on the cross of Calvary, that the second death is our, our destiny if we will not accept the righteousness of God, then you would think that we would have enough incentive, don't you? I also um, quoted a little quotation last week from Third Selected Messages 202, paragraph 2, something that I've repeated many times. Our sanctification is God's object in all his dealings with us. It doesn't matter what God has done, what he's doing, what he intends to do. 
our sanctification is God's object. He came to this world. He left heaven. He lived a perfect life. He died an atoning death. He resurrected. He went to heaven. He petitions his father on behalf of all of us today. And he works in our lives. Uh, what's the word? I lose more words than I gain lately. In any ways... Uh, providentially, that's the word I'm looking for. He's working in our lives providentially every day, every day. And our sanctification is God's object in all his doing, all his dealings with us. That's what he wants. He wants to restore the image of Jesus Christ. He wants to restore the image of God in all of his people. And he wants us to cooperate with him in this thing. Now I promised that I would show you how easy it is. And it's really, really easy. And you'll agree with me, although it's, it's um, however easy it is, remember, it has to do with incentive, right? So what I want you to do now is bring to the fore, not out loud, what you want to do is bring to the fore in your own mind what it is that you're struggling with uh, that we would call sin or bad habits today. There must be something, or am I the only one? I doubt it very much. So in any case, we have things that we struggle for, and I would like to invite you to bring that to your mind now, okay? And here's the question that I want to ask you. If I asked you not to do this thing for 24 hours, could you do it? You think? Of course, surely, right? I mean, if we really gritted our teeth, I, you know, I don't know what it is you're struggling with. I mean, there, there's every sin you can think of in the world. This, this may be it. I have no idea. I doubt that there's anyone here who's committed murder, who, uh, who's uh, a thief. Uh, really, more or less, you've become Seventh-day Adventist. You've given your heart to the Lord. You're probably not into dishonesty or anything like that. But there are other things like... Uh, uh, eating the wrong things or overeating or um, pornography is a probably is assumed to be a big problem among among pastors in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I don't know how bad it is, but it's it's apparently so. And there are things like anger. We need anger management. You know, there's frustrations of all kinds. And so there are sin. Uh, and probably if I think uh, of myself, for 24 hours, you know, if food is a problem, I'll fast for 24 hours. <laughs> and there you go. Well, here's what I'll do for you. I'm going to come with $2,000 and I'm going to say to you, do you think that you could stop doing this thing for 24 hours? And if you do, I'll give you $2,000 uh, tomorrow, 24 hours from now. What do you think? Could you do it? Yeah, of course. Man, that's $2,000. So well, the next day come, you've succeeded in doing this. I give you $2,000. And then I say, wait a minute, it's not over. I'll give you $4,000 more if you can do it for another 24 hours. What do you think? Well, that's $6,000 in two days. Why not? Man, I could use the money, right? And so you don't do it for another 24 hours then we come together again and I'll say to you well, I'll give you I'll give you twelve dollars uh, twelve thousand dollars if you can do it a third day and I'll give you twenty four thousand dollars if you can do it a fourth day and I'll give you forty eight thousand dollars if you can do it a fifth day how long do you think you could keep it up and not sin that sin as long as the money lasts <laughs> yeah. as long as there is incentive right does that make sense well it's a tragic uh, tragedy it's more than a tragedy it's a travesty because who can equate millions of dollars to what heaven will be worth the value of living eternally in a blissful place forever where there is no pain and there is no sorrow and there is no death and there is everything is positive and we don't see it as incentive enough to overcome sin for 24 hours. Or, well, maybe, maybe, maybe even 48 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, there's a problem with my illustration. I don't know if you've caught it. 
but I am appealing to your greed. <laughs> really? And so it doesn't work. God can't use it. Because if, if it wasn't appealing to our sins in order to get us to quit sinning, it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So God, all that God has to offer is what he is and what he has to offer. But friends, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense that it's not enough incentive for you and for me. What is eternal life worth? Isn't that enough incentive? Anyway, I want to spend the rest of the time, which it shouldn't be very long, really, giving you five incentives um, in order to find reason why we should be sanctified, why sanctification should matter to us, why we should pour forth our cooperation in working with God to restore the image of God in us. And the first one has to do with vindicating God's name, vindicating God's character before the universe. We all know that in heaven, Satan approached the angels and he told all the angels that they didn't need the law of God. Well, for sure. I mean, that's a good argument. The angels were perfect. They were created perfect. They never sinned. Why would they need the law of God? Well, Lucifer himself had fallen. He'd already sinned. Why did he sin? Didn't he know the, what, the thing that he was doing was wrong? And so obviously, even though they're all perfect angels, the argument didn't hold water. So Satan comes down to our world. He comes down to this earth, to Adam and Eve. And of course, he causes them by temptation to sin as well. Then he changes his tune and he says, you see, it's not possible anyway to keep God's law. It's too hard. Yeah. And that's what he keeps saying. And God says, no. I have a people who will vindicate my name and my government and my law. Will it happen? Oh, friends, it's going to happen. It's, it's amazing good news. It's never happened. Of course, it's happened in people like Enoch and Joseph, maybe Daniel, Moses. But even Moses fell, and I, and I suppose the others had some kind of sin that they were wrestling with. Elijah, John the Baptist. Yeah. But it's never happened corporately. And the devil can hold that over the Lord. I mean, the Lord can point him to Enoch and say, see, it's already happened. <laughs> yes, yes, it's happened, but you have a church. You have a people, and they've never done it as a people. And God said, they will. And they will. And so if we study Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' messages, we understand, at least we should understand what is being said there, and we should internalize what we learn of it, what we understand of it. And by internalizing the three angels' messages, all that it includes, we they, the three angels' messages, should form the 144,000. And we know that the 144,000 have the Father's name written in their foreheads, the Father's character in their characters. They sing a new song, a song that's never been sung before. They're not corrupted with the falsehoods of other churches. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're without guile in their mouths because out of the, the depths of the heart the mouth speaketh. And of course, they stand faultless before the throne of God. Praise the Lord, they've done it. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And then Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. The whole world is lightened with the glory of God as it is found in His people. The whole world sees it. And God says, okay, I can come now. They've been warned. In Faith and Works, page 42, paragraph 4, it says, God will have a people who will vindicate his honor by, res have, by having respect to all his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. They are not a yoke of bondage. It's easy, is what he's trying to say. And his name will be vindicated. Isn't that an incentive? We're on God's side and we're here to defend God. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't do it. 
but he can do it through us. Praise the Lord. Incentive number two. Justification, of course, is our ticket to heaven. And we appreciate the ticket. It costs us nothing. He gives us the ticket, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But sanctification is our what? Our fitness for heaven. Go with me to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Notice that's the John in the back of the Bible. And we're looking at verse 2 and 3 in 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. On what basis? On the basis of justification. Jesus went to the cross with our sins and he adopted us as children of God if we accept the gift. But it goes on. And it does not, and I would have started with the word but, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. Obviously, there's more work to do here. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. By beholding, we become changed. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. There is incentive in hope. And God says he can do this. And he's going to do it. In first selected messages, 395, it says, We shall not enjoy heaven unless qualified for its holy atmosphere. A couple of weeks ago when I was here, I'm trying to find there what I said. <laughs> My question was, have you ever heard anyone say that they wouldn't want to live to be 100? Well, there are people who say stuff like that. I'd like to live to be 100, but do you know that the older you get, the less quality of life there is. It kind of disintegrates as you go. It gets less and less. And, and there are conditions, there are people living in conditions today that are horrible and they don't want to live anymore. They're stuck in a body that's just full of pain and, and sorrow and guilt and whatever all it might be. Uh, I think in our last study, we talked about coming to the end or the last resurrection and God, when they attack the city, God comes up over the top of the city and he shows them his Ten Commandments and, and he explains to them what Jesus suffered for their sins and the immensity of the guilt that they suffered. And then God could say, okay, yeah, you can live forever if you want to. Go ahead, live forever. Do you think they'd want to live under that auspice? <laughs> no. It would be a terrible life. Never mind living a hundred years under a, 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 a pain like that. To live forever that way? They wouldn't want to live like that forever. And so if, well, if you go with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're looking at verse um, 27 in Revelation 21. And there shall in no wise enter into it heaven anything that defileth, neither whatsoever works an abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so we will find millions and billions of people who are living under a sense of guilt. They can't get into heaven. Why? Because the Lord closes the door? No. Because they wouldn't want to. They're not qualified, and the atmosphere in heaven is not what they appreciate. They just, they just can't stand it. Incentive number three. Who are we, excuse me, who we are, is to be an influence exerted upon the world around us. God needs witnesses, and so sanctification, of course, creates witnesses. If there's no difference between me and the atheists on the, tr on the street, then there's no influence. That, it's just that simple. The more we are like Jesus, the contrast between the Christian and the rest of the world becomes more and more impactful as we reflect the image of Jesus more. And so we become witnesses. God needs our witness in this world. There is no witness if there is no change, if there is no difference. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we're looking at verses 12 and 13. We know this great chapter to be uh, Jesus explaining the last days and uh, future prophecies. 
Matthew 24, we're looking at verse 12 and 13. We might even look at verse 14. And because iniquity shall abound, it's abounding. It's around us. It's everywhere. And we cannot escape it. And it's discouraging. I don't know about you. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, influenced by the world. But he that shall endure unto the end, that is, maintain, retain their justification, justifying righteousness and increasing in reflection of Jesus. If they will endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And watch, then this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Wow. That's how it's meant to be for us. If I don't know if that's incentive for you, but I'd like to be a blessing to the people with whom I have anything to do. I would hate to dishonor God in front of anyone, on any basis at all. In the book, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 369, paragraph two, it's talking about Israel. Israel were meant to be a witness in this world, but, but they took the blessings of God and hoarded them. They thought the rest of the world were the bad guys. They were the good guys. God favored them and he hated the others. God led, excuse me, God called Israel, blessed and exalted them, not by, not that by obedience to his law, they alone might receive his favor and become the exclusive recipients of his blessings, but in order to reveal himself through them to all the inhabitants of the earth. It was for the accomplishment of this very purpose that he commanded them to keep themselves distinct from the idolatrous nations around them. When we do as worldlings do, when personal ambitions override God's cause, when greed dampens our generosity, when pride informs our decisions, when we eat or dress or watch or read as the world does, when education is pursued for the purpose of making money rather than to equip us to serve, then we've forgotten. Perhaps we've never known the sanctification that God wants to work in our lives. I don't know. Incentive number four. I read last week, not well, maybe it's two weeks ago, whatever it is, might even be three. <laughs> That assurance is based on God's promises. Now, I know that the um, evangelicals uh, take the word assurance as in blessed assurance. And what they think when they say that it's is that if you can say, I believe in Jesus Christ, we have assurance, right, of salvation. <laughs> yeah, but that's not what assurance is. Assurance is found in the Word of God. The assurance is found in God's promises. Do you think that God would lie to us? Why no? So when you read the Word of God and you see a promise of God, you understand the condition, you meet the condition, then the promise is unequivocal. You have what God has promised. You have the assurance of the promise that God has made. But if you want to know if you have salvation, you need evidence. And do you know where you find evidence? You find evidence in your walk with God. That's why Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. That's the evidence. We can see that in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 3. 1 John 2 verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him. Hereby we do know that we have salvation. If we keep his commandments. Now if you think I have overstretched that verse. Let me read it to you from Christ Object Lessons. Page 313. She quotes this verse and then she says. This is the genuine evidence of conversion. You want some evidence 
that you have conversion by your fruit we shall know you and you shall know yourself as well final final incentive for sanctification do you know that everyone in this world wants to be happy do you know that we do everything we can to be happy <laughs> yeah and so people drink beer to be happy some people take drugs to be happy some people you know they think happiness comes in all but God knows only God knows what makes us happy and and he can make us happy and so he's given us a book and he's given us the law and he's given us the spirit of prophecy and he says if you can bring the closer you can bring your life into harmony with what is written in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy the happier you will be that's how it works it's wonderful go with me to 2nd Chronicles 2nd Chronicles chapter 16 I wrote that there in my notes by memory now I'm thinking I sure hope I got the right verse uh, second Chronicles chapter 16 this is uh, aimed at Asa who was king it was actually a rebuke to Asa um, when the Lord gave it but we'll just take part of the verse we'll read the whole verse but we'll take the 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 last part verse 9 Second Chronicles chapter 16, and we're looking at verse 9. Then he said, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord says, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the wrong chapter. <laughs> I thought, oh no, I didn't take the wrong verse. No, my pages still stick together in my new Bible. Verse 9, let's do, let's do it again. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro to throughout the whole earth. What for? To show himself strong. What does God want to do? He wants to reveal himself. This is salvation to know God and Jesus Christ. This is salvation. That's what John chapter 17 verse 3 says. And this is what God wants, right? This is what we're reading here. Verse 9. The, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He wants to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect or holy towards him. There you go. There you go. You and I would not be happy otherwise. Not as happy as we could be, for sure. I know that happiness is found in the center of God's will. So why is it important? that we pursue cooperation with God in our sanctification for the vindication of God's character to be witnesses in our characters to the world around us to be fitted for heaven's culture we won't be happy there if we are not happy here in it for evidence that we are saved and for our own happiness and usefulness this is what God wants from us. Is that incentive enough for you? Ah, friends, listen. I wish I could emphasize the importance of this. It is so important. And yet the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who was raised for that very purpose, that's what we were raised for, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, full of God's presence in us so that the whole world could be lightened with God's, gl God's glory. This is why he raised the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's what Jesus is doing in the most holy place of the sanctuary. But we have never bought into it fully. Maybe we've never understood fully. Maybe we still don't. Obviously, Jesus hasn't come yet. And so I would like to urge upon all of us the need to cooperate with God in the fullest sense of the word. Turn with me to hymn number 608. Hymn number 
together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want the victory. We want to glorify your holy name, vindicate you and your law. We want to be a witness in this world. We want to be happy and we want to know that we have salvation and the proof is in our lives and in our daily walk. We understand that that is so. We just ask that you would give us the power to cooperate with you, make us willing to be willing, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.